Hi, and welcome to Lecture 6 on Cellular Respiration. So these are the common misconceptions for cellular respiration. So before you enter into listening to this lecture, I want you to think about how do you think food in our diet gets broken down and then used for kinetic energy? Some common misconceptions from your peers are things like respiration and breathing are the same thing. So cellular respiration and then respiration, breathing in, breathing out, those are the same thing. So see if you can debunk that as you go through this lecture. The second one would be that plants photosynthesize and animals respire. So that means that plants don't respire. So a really common misconception is that plants just go through photosynthesis. They don't go through cellular respiration. So think about that as you're listening. Food in our diet directly fuels our metabolic needs. What I'm saying there is that people often think that carbohydrates and fats and even proteins in our diet, folks think that that is what is directly fueling something like a muscle contra contraction. And that's totally false. It has to be turned into ATP, right? And so listen to the uh, lecture to figure out how that's going to be happening. Cellular res respiration basically takes the food that you eat in your diet, carbohydrates and fats, and converts them into ATP. This figure is an overview of this where you have a mitochondria here that would be within a cell and what's happening is you're taking glucose and you're making it into ATP and you can see a picture of ATP there. Now that ATP is used for things inside of the nucleus like copying DNA, which is DNA replication, cell division, which that's involved in, uh, and then also outside of the nucleus making macromolecules like uh, the formation of proteins that we talked about, membrane transport, um, ATP can be used for when it's active transport, cytoskeletal organization, making uh, microtubules and microfilaments, we're going to be talking more about that when we look at cell division, moving things inside the cell, so if you're moving a vacuole and you're moving along cytoskeleton like the little clip I showed, that's going to take ATP and then whole cell movement as well. So ATP is essential. Um, cells can't really use uh, carbohydrates per se. On their own, they're pretty much meaningless. You have to turn it into ATP because that's cellular energy. So we're going to be talking about both aerobic and anaerobic respiration and we're going to be focusing on plants and humans, basically. So we're going to look at plants and animals, humans specifically for animals. Now, when you're looking at uh, aerobic and anaerobic respiration, both of those processes start with the reaction of glycolysis. Glycolysis happens in all living things. ATP is such a nifty little molecule that all cells on Earth use it. And so when you bring in food, whether you're making it if you're autotrophic or whether you're eating it if you're heterotrophic, you've got to process it. And the first step in processing it is called glycolysis. Now, if you're going through anaerobic respiration without the use of oxygen, you just stay in the pink here. So you've got glycolysis, <clears throat> and then you can turn those products for humans into lactate, uh, some organisms like yeast turn into alcohol. We're going to be focusing on lactate fermentation. So anaerobic is in pink, all three of those. We'll specifically be talking about glycolysis and lactate fermentation. So glycolysis is anaerobic respiration, but it's also the first set step in aerobic respiration. So here's glycolysis. You've got to do this before you do this. And so we're going to be talking about both of those processes today. For aerobic respiration, we're going to be dealing with the mitochondria. For anaerobic respiration, we're just going to be working in the cytoplasm. I'd like to draw uh, some of these reactions out for you. I have a picture of that slide that I'm going to draw on to show you basically the function of each of these. You don't need to know the details that happen in each of these sets of reactions, but we're going to go for kind of the big picture here. So you can see the title here. We've got glycolysis, which I said is anaerobic respiration. 
And that's happening in the cytoplasm. And then for aerobic respiration, you've got the mitochondria. And that includes two reactions. We're going to call one the Krebs cycle. And then oxidative phosphorylation is the third. So for anaerobic respiration, it's just one. For aerobic respiration, it's one, two, three. Everything. Let's talk anaerobic respiration first. Glycolysis specifically, if you're looking at a glucose molecule, each of these points represents a carbon. If you look at this term, glycolysis, glycolysis, you're taking glucose and you're splitting it. Kind of like photolysis, light splitting. Now we have glucose splitting. And so what's going to happen is this. You're going to take that carbohydrate and you're going to cut it in half. That's going to give you two, three carbon sugars. So you're going to have one, two, three, that's one. And that's your second one. So no longer are you going to have this ring form. You're going to have two straight chains and they're just going to have three carbons each. It's half a carb. And those are called pyruvates. With anaerobic respiration, you stop there. That's it. So <laughs> you get your two pyruvates, and if you were going to stop here, those would be converted for humans into what you know is lactic acid. So this is anaerobic respiration, all happening in the cytoplasm. And it basically is splitting a carb in half. So if you need really immediate energy, if you're going to be lifting weights, or you're going to be sprinting, aerobic respiration takes so long, you have all three of those processes. So anaerobic is going to supply your energy. It's basically carbs splitting in the cytoplasm. When you do this, you generate about 2 ATP, so not a lot of ATP, but it is quick energy, and it is our backup pathway. So when we have really intense bursts of activity, we supplement aerobic respiration with anaerobic respiration. It just happens in the cytoplasm. You're just splitting a carbohydrate in half. Now, let's say that the energetic demand is not super high and you want to go through aerobic respiration. What you're going to do is move those pyruvates into the mitochondria. It would be facilitated diffusion. You're not going to spend energy to move it in. It would be moving from high to low, cytoplasm into the mitochondria. And it moves into what's called the Krebs cycle. The function of the Krebs cycle is to remove the hydrogens. Now what I'd like to do is draw you a pyruvate so that I can illustrate the importance of this particular cycle. So down here I'm going to draw your three carbons and then, you know, what carbohydrates have on them are OH groups, right? They're just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if that's one pyruvate, and the goal of the Krebs cycle is to remove the hydrogens, take all these off, what you're left with is carbon and oxygen. So carbon and oxygen are actually the waste products, and those get removed. That's why we exhale CO2. Carbon dioxide builds up in the mitochondria because your pyruvates, all you really want out of those are the hydrogens. So if you think about it, the food that you eat, the energy molecules that you eat, carbohydrates and triglycerides, you just need the hydrogens off of them. You take those hydrogens and those are what you're using to form ATP. This gives you about 2 ATP and you can see that CO2 is given off. So what do we do with those hydrogens? We remove the hydrogens and we get rid of everything else as waste. So the byproduct is CO2. That's one of the byproducts of aerobic respiration. These hydrogens are going to have to be carried over to oxidative phosphorylation. So you're going to have an energy carrier again 
only this time it's just a little bit different from NADP in photosynthesis. This one is called NAD and it can hold two hydrogens at once and it delivers them to oxidative phosphorylation. So now NAD is the taxi cab, whereas in photosynthesis, NADP was the taxi cab. Now what happens in oxidative phosphorylation, the purpose of oxidati oxidative phosphorylation is to produce a lot of ATP. And so this is how it works. These hydrogens link up with oxygen that we breathe. So there's H2O2, and that looks very similar to water, right? You're close, H2O2. What's going to happen is enzymes are going to come and split your oxygen in half, and you're going to form water. This may seem benign, but this is a huge downhill reaction. When you make water, that's a very, a much stabler molecule than having a single oxygen. So these want to be bonded together, and it's a downhill reaction, and the formation of water generates, just like we saw in photosynthesis, another nice hydrogen ion gradient. And again, you have ATP synthase. Hopefully you're seeing by now that this works so well, it's redundant in organelles. Both photosynthesis and respiration use it. And so when hydrogen ions move through there, just like in photosynthesis, it causes mechanical motion in the actual ATP synthase protein. And that allows for ATP synthase to phosphorylate. And when you use this type of a system, when you use a protein like this, you can produce many more ATP than you would have otherwise. So this system produces 32 ATP. It was very, very effective. So the function of oxidative phosphorylation is to produce ATP. It does that by taking hydrogens from your food and oxygen that you breathe and making water. So your byproducts of aerobic respiration are water and CO2. So a carbohydrate that you're eating would give you 36 ATP, roughly. A triglyceride is going to give you about 129 ATP. If you consider a bite of butter versus a bite of bagel, the bite of butter is going to give you more calories because it inherently has more potential energy in it. The reason for that is because it has many more hydrogens than a carb does. So that means that NAD can carry a lot more hydrogens. And as long as molecular oxygen is present, that means many more water molecules. Big, big, big gradients, lots of ATP. So fats are going to deliver more ATP than a carbohydrate would, and that is because it actually has more hydrogens on it. So you can count the hydrogens here versus on a triglyceride where each of these has H2, H2, H2 on each point. Lots more hydrogens on the fat. Proteins, this is an amino acid, these are not energy molecules. These are used to make other proteins in the body. But if you're in a pinch and you're deprived of calories, you're starving, you will go ahead and break down protein in the body and burn it. So you can burn this in emergency situations, but it's not designed to be an energy use molecule. It's designed to make proteins. Okay, so let's compare plants and animals for aerobic respiration. So let's start with autotrophs, with plants. Here I have a picture of a plant leaf, and inside of this leaf I'm showing a plant cell, 
and inside the plant cell you have chloroplast and mitochondria. So for plants, where do they get their oxygen and carbohydrate from to do aerobic respiration? They get the oxygen from photolysis, right, the splitting of water, in photosynthesis. They get the carbohydrate from the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis. So they get oxygen and a carbohydrate from photosynthesis. Both of their inputs are coming out of the chloroplast, and they're right there. And so they're used in aerobic respiration. Notice also that one of the inputs for photosynthesis, plants don't always have to use CO2 from the atmosphere. They can use CO2 from the Krebs cycle. They could use water from the Krebs cycle, from uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So there are some products here that could be used in photosynthesis as well. In terms of heterotrophs, where we get O2 as well as carbohydrates, it's, it's all extraneous, right? It's, uh, we have to have these systems in order to bring in carbohydrates and oxygen. So we have heart, lungs, blood vessels, all of that to be able to bring in oxygen to carry carbohydrates from food. So obviously from the atmosphere and from food for heterotroph. So very different in terms of aerobic respiration. The last thing I'd like to do is compare and contrast aerobic versus anaerobic respiration. And this table does this. You can see your parameters here. In your left column, you have aerobic respiration. In the right column, you have anaerobic respiration. The first thing would be location. For aerobic respiration, you have to do glycolysis. All living things do glycolysis. It's the precursor, the first reaction in aerobic respiration. So it's happening in the cytoplasm for glycolysis, and then Krebs and oxidative phosphorylation are happening in the mitochondria. For anaerobic respiration, you're just always in the cytoplasm. In terms of ATP of a carbohydrate, which is your immediate energy use molecule, 36 versus 2 ATP, so aerobic wins hands down, right? Your inputs are, you need oxygen, so you need a little extra input here for aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration, you don't need oxygen. Your byproducts are pretty harmless, CO2 and water. Uh, we have systems set in place, buffers in the blood to deal with high CO2 levels, and we exhale and we get rid of that. A waste product pretty easily. Anaerobic produces lactic acid in humans and that is something that when if it builds up in really high levels can affect muscles but for the average person um, this is not an issue at all. Only for like ultra marathon runners and things like that. The steps involved, there are three for aerobic respiration, while only really one, two for anaerobic respiration. And what that means is that anaerobic respiration is super fast, and that is why it's used as backup for really intense activity. Aerobic is slow, okay, and so it's going to meet kind of your base metabolic needs, and anything above that, you're going to have to supplement with anaerobic respiration. So in class, what we're going to do is look at exercise science, and we'll go ahead and talk about muscle fiber types and tie the, these pathways into activity. Okay, that concludes uh, your lecture on uh, aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration.